Well, good morning, church family. We are so glad you've joined us and welcome to Church at Home. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jordan Massey. I have the privilege of being the pastor at our Southwest campus here at Westside. And we are looking forward to a great time together, even while we are apart. Hey, if this is your first time with us, maybe you're new to Westside, we would love to hear from you, even if you're just watching from home for the very first time. If you go to our website, westsidebaptist.org, slash I'm new, you can fill out a form, let us know that we're, you're with us, and we would love to reach out to just say thank you. But we're looking forward to an awesome time with the Lord, even as we're in our homes and not together. We are grateful for you, and we're grateful for the Spirit uh, that unites us this morning. We want to say thank you as well because we have been so amazed at your faithfulness in giving, and we just want to continue to encourage you to keep that rhythm of faithful giving, even while we're not gathering together. Uh, you can give a few different ways. You can give from your app. You can give from westsidebaptist.org slash give, or you can just mail in your check. Whatever way works best for you, uh, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to keep that faithful rhythm of giving and discipleship. But hey, at Westside, we value prayer over might. We think that there's nothing we can do without the strength and help of the Lord, and especially in a time like this, in a time where so many people are hurting, whether it be financially, economically, whether it be physically, whether their health is failing, whatever it is, we know that the prayer needs are many in our community and around us, and we know without the help of the Lord, there's nothing we can do. And so right now, we just want to spend some time at the very opening of our service in prayer. We want to spend some time before the Lord praying. So I hope that if you're joining with us, watching via video, that you would join us right now in prayer, whether you're on your couch or you're in your kitchen or whatever it looks like for you, we hope that right here, right now, you would join us as we spend some time in prayer. We also want you to know that if you have any prayer requests, uh, you can let us know. We would love to be praying for you. You can go to westsidebaptist.org slash prayer and, and let us know what's going on. How can we pray for you uh, we're, we're so uh, excited about this time because we know that the Lord is truly going to come through, but we know that in order for that to happen, we need to be on our knees in prayer. And so right now, would you just join me from home as we go before the Lord praying? Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us, even while we're separated physically. God, we know that your spirit unites us. And Lord, we just pray right now, we desperately need your spirit. And so we just pray that right now your spirit would work and move, that your spirit would draw us to worship, even if it seems weird from our homes, that your spirit would prepare our hearts for your word. God, we pray that your spirit would give us peace in such a restless time, that your spirit would give comfort in the midst of so much pain Lord, we just pray that you would work and move right here, right now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, wherever you're at this morning, if you would stand as we worship together. Let's sing together this morning. Who am I?
I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world be.
Well, good morning. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and we want to turn to the book of Mark this morning and begin a real brief series called Jesus is King. And I know that ought to be an incredibly comforting thought for you, but it's also a challenging thought. But it's a thought that all of us need to, to focus in on around this Easter time. And, and it's amazing in this short gospel of Mark with 16 chapters, the last six chapters are all about the final week of his life. You can tell just by that much of the text being dedicated to that passion week. You can tell that that is the most important focus of his life. We've seen Jesus as the healer, as the master in all of his glory in his his walk up to this week, but now we're going to see all of the purpose and all the reason for Jesus' coming. And I hope it will be encouraging to you. I just want to take a moment to thank uh, my staff team. Uh, if you could see it, we're in basically an empty room with just some our bare bones staff uh, shooting this worship event and our music staff. We're so grateful for them. Uh, I know most of you are, are shut in. We have a an order from our local government, our county government, just to stay at home, basically, except for the necessary things. And <clears throat> it's interesting, as I was sitting at home over the last couple of days, I was working on my message and thinking about how many people have been placed under order to stay at home. And I, and I had a little bit of a flashback to some times when I was a kid. <clears throat> and... Uh, what would happen is I would often get in a lot of fights with my younger brother. And of course, that was when, when we got in most of our trouble. And I can't imagine how frustrating it must have been for my mom to have to deal with two young boys that were always kind of fighting. We were very competitive with each other. But she knew how to handle the situation. Uh, as we got bigger and bigger, she stopped kind of getting in the middle of it. And, and she would break up the fight or, you know, break up whatever was going on that we were doing wrong. And and send us to our rooms. And she always had this phrase, this, you're, you're going in time out. And I want you to go into your room, and I want to put you uh, under orders not to move. And you're going to sit there, and you're going to think about what you've done. You're going to think about how you have gotten out of alignment with the uh, plan for our home. And you're thirdly, you're going to think about the fact that Daddy's coming. He's coming home soon. And when he comes home from work, He's going to address the situation. And I can remember sometimes sitting there for a couple of hours and, and I thought a little bit about uh, uh, the things that I'd done and for the most part I felt like it was my brother's fault. You know how it is. But uh, the one thing that was constantly on my mind as I was under shutdown, as I was sitting in my room waiting, is that pretty soon I was going to have to face the arrival of the Father, the arrival of really the king of our house. And you know, when we come to the Bible, there are two key uh, arrivals. The arrival of Jesus in the end, when he comes as judge, when he comes and he casts Satan out, when he comes and he brings this world unto complete judgment. In a sense, that's a terrifying thought. In fact, in Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. You know, Jesus, according to Scripture, is going to arrive as king. And when he arrives in the future as king, he comes in a rather frightening way because he's coming this next time as a judge. And let me just read a little bit more out of the book of Revelation. It says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He comes in on this grand white stallion, symbolic of the fact that he's coming as a warrior. He's coming as a, a king who's coming to judge. He's one, and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with the rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Listen, this morning we know in Jesus is King. And He is coming again. And when He comes again, He's coming on a, a mighty white horse. He's coming with the armies of heaven. He's coming as a, as a judge after thousands of years of grace, thousands of years of reaching out in mercy to humanity. He will come again. But in Mark chapter 11, we see the first of his two arrivals as king. You and I live between his first arrival and his second coming. His first coming to a city called Jerusalem and his second coming where he'll come again to Jerusalem. The second time he's on a white horse, the first time, as we'll see in our text today, he comes in on a, on a white donkey. He comes in on a colt. He comes in humility. And he comes today to bring peace, to offer us peace, to offer us salvation. I just feel like the Lord wants us while we've, we're in a period of time out as human beings, as Americans, as people in Alachua County. We've got some time out. And I truly believe the Holy Spirit wants to capitalize on this time out to have us think about some of those same things. Are we as the children of God, are we in alignment with the King's purpose? Are we in alignment with what the Father wants us to do? Or have we been busy doing things maybe that aren't that important? Or maybe we've been getting involved in things we shouldn't be involved in? I think we ought to take advantage of this time out to think, to look at the King, and to ask Him, Jesus, what are we supposed to be doing? What is life really about? As the things that we face and we, we, we uh, place our security and our hope in, seem to be drifting away. I mean, that brings sadness. It's tragic. And, and we don't know what the future holds, but we need to understand what Jesus would teach us through this. And I think it's going to expose some of the idols in our life, some of the things that we shouldn't be involved in in our life, and then it's also going to push us towards a reality that is absolutely incredible, a truth. There is a king, and he brings us peace. And he wants to rule in our lives. And so in Mark chapter 11, I want us to see this incredible king as he unveils himself to the city of Jerusalem. And then as he calls a time out, he literally stops the worship in the temple so that he can speak. And we want to hear in his time out what the king wants to say. Let's look at the arrival of the king as we have it here in Mark chapter 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And we'll, I will send, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there, as you can imagine, said, Hey, what are you doing with that? Untying the colt. And they told them exactly what Jesus had said. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus that had never been ridden. And they threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And then many spread their cloaks on the road. Can you just see that? Jesus on this small colt, walking across the cloaks of people, heading in to his city, the king's city. And then there were others who were spreading leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting. They were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting some of the psalms that they had memorized, that they would sing. They were basically proclaiming, this is our king. This is the promised Messiah. And the word Hosanna means, save us, Messiah. Save us now. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus comes in and he doesn't hide who he is. 
If you've been following along in our previous series, you know that Jesus was, would sometimes uh, try to uh, cover his identity because he wanted the timing to be perfect. But this is the moment that he just takes the covers off. He unveils himself to the city. Now, many don't recognize him for who he is, even as that, and that's the truth today. But he boldly allows his disciples and others to point to him and say, this is the king of Israel. This is the coming Messiah. Now, why did he pick a cult? Because that is what it declares. If we, uh, a lot of the folks that were doing this would have known Zechariah 9.9. They would have understood the scripture prophesied that their Messiah would arrive on a cult. Let me read that to you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So for Jesus to come in and basically tell the folks, hey, the Lord wants his foal. He was basically saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to fulfill the prophecies that you have in Scripture, and I'm coming in peace. I'm coming on this unridden animal. And that would have been uh, something that a king would have done. It wasn't that a king would never ride a colt. But often a king or a high priest would ride a colt that had never been ridden before. When we see him on that colt, we see Jesus making a bold claim. A claim that is absolutely true. He is the king. And then they begin to spread their cloaks and, and, and shout Hosanna. They were praising him. But it's important that we understand not only were they praising him, they were asking him When they shout Hosanna, they're basically saying, save us now. They were looking to Jesus as a Savior, but a Savior in a different way. They wanted him to rid them of the contagion of the Roman Empire. They saw the the virus that had spread across their land in that day was the Roman Empire. And they believed the Messiah would come and get the Gentiles out of Jerusalem, get the Romans out of power, and would bring them the relief that they need. You know, this past week, they've been voting on a a gigantic relief package to help us uh, and help businesses, and that's great. I hope there's a relief package. But Jesus, you, you need to see that's what they saw Jesus as. That's why It was only a few days later that uh, the city was crying, crucify him, because between his arrival and his crucifixion, Jesus made it very clear. I'm not a relief package. I'm not here just to relieve your suffering. I'm here for something far greater than you can imagine. They wanted a divine relief package, not a divine ruler. They wanted someone to cleanse the land not really to cleanse their hearts. As I've sat in time out this week, I've been reminded that that's what Jesus is. He's a ruler, but he's come not as a relief package, but as a redeemer, as someone to bring me something that maybe I didn't even realize I knew, and they didn't understand uh, really, truly what it is that he was coming to do. It was to meet not an immediate need, but an eternal need. Need, And so he comes, and he declares himself king. Now, as we continue to read in this gospel, and I hope you're following along at home, or you can maybe see it on the screen in front of you, what you're going to see in the next few verses is rather interesting. The scholars call it a Markan sandwich. Um, Mark wrote this gospel. But one of the things that we see throughout the gospel is he would take a story, he would begin a particular story, then he would insert a story in the middle, and then he'd finish the first story that had started, like two pieces of bread with the meat in between. And what we're going to see is he's going to start a a story about a fig tree, a fruit tree, and then he's going to end the story back at that same fruit tree, and in the middle, we have the cleansing of the temple. So we go from a tree 
to the cleansing of the temple, back to the fig tree, and all of those things together teach us something incredible. And here's the two things he wants us to know. As we're sitting in time out, he wants us to know, listen, I am king, but my kingdom has something uh, very unique. It has a unique priority, and my kingdom has a unique power. The priority of the kingdom of Jesus is maybe not what everybody would expect. It's not the relief package. It's something bigger than that. And, and the power of his kingdom is not demonstrated in the horses and the chariots and the great power of Herod and the Roman Empire. It's not the kind of power that people were expecting through the Messiah. It's a different kind of power. And so I want us to leave the, the message today and, and just hear our king invite us into a life that has a different priority and a different power. And so he calls time out. And let's watch this. It's rather interesting as we read uh, about the priority of his kingdom. Let's look at verse 11. It says, And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, this was late at night, he, he went back out of the city, back up to Bethany. So he would stay outside of the city in Bethany with his disciples. Now he's coming back the following day after he had seen all the activity that was happening in the temple. He comes back the back day. And, and, and Jesus never does anything by accident. In verse 13, he sees in the distance a fig tree that has leaves on it. Looks like it's healthy. But he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples overheard it. Now let me just tell you what happened. There's regular fig fruit, and then there are the pods that come out earlier in the year that actually will, will grow into the figs, and you could pluck those pods, and they would eat those like a fruit as well. And so he came up, and he saw the leaves that indicated maybe it had some of those pods, but it had no pods. It was not a fruit-bearing tree. And he wasn't surprised by this. He wanted the disciples to hear this. The fig tree often represented Israel, the nation of Israel. And the tree is going to represent the temple he's about to go into. He, get, he sees the tree and it doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't give him what the king desires. And he's going to go into the temple and he's going to find the same thing. They were supposed to be bearing fruit for his kingdom and they weren't bearing any. And so the tree and the temple are made synonymous to teach us about the real priority of Jesus' kingdom. And he does something in this verse he doesn't do anywhere else. He he actually curses this tree and he speaks to it almost like a person because he he's wants his disciples to, it's like a living parable. He wants them to see the relationship between fruit-bearing tree and what he really intends for Israel and his kingdom to be. It's all about bearing fruit. It's not about what he's going to see when he goes into the temple in just a moment. So they, they keep this in the back of their mind, and, and they keep heading into the temple area. And so he goes into the temple area, and uh, he sees something that brings him great disturbance. He goes into the temple area, and he comes to understand that that temple is full of money changers. Look at verse 15. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. It's interesting. If you look at that verse, something amazing has happened. It shows the incredible authority that Jesus carried just in his personage, in his voice, in his manner. And, and they, they, they basically ceased operations when he drove the money changers out. Now, here's why he drove them out. If you look in verse 17, he begins to teach them. And he says, now that I've got your attention, now that you're in quiet time, now that there's a time out, let me remind you what the Bible says. Look what he says in verse six, 17. Is it not written... My house, meaning his temple, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den 
of, rob of robbers. Now, we'll hear this verse quoted a lot of times, and a lot of times people will quote it as a support for praying in church. Now, we all know we ought to be praying in church, but this is not a verse about praying in church. This is a, this is a verse about the fact that the people of Israel and the Jewish leadership had filled the court of the Gentiles with business. You see, the court was set up and God's house was set up not just for the Jewish people. There was this massive area outside of the interior parts. There was this massive area that God declared he wanted there. It was in the original Zion. He wanted a court of the Gentiles. He never wanted to exclude the Gentiles he, or the rest of the world. He wanted the, the people of Israel and his house to be a place that invited all the nations in so that they could come and worship. Now, as time had gone by, there was rabbinic teaching and all sorts of Jewish leadership there uh, in those that had, had begun to replace that priority with their own teaching. In fact, if you went to the Psalms of Solomon, it's an apocryphal type book, uh, if you went to that book, it actually declared that, that when the Messiah came, he would clear the temple of Gentiles. And what Jesus comes to do is he clears the temple for Gentiles. So he silences all of the activity so that he can speak. And when he speaks, he says, this kingdom is not just for you. This kingdom is a house of prayer, a house of worship for all the nations. Now, where in the world did he get that from? It was clearly written in the scriptures. Let me read to you Isaiah 56. He was quoting Isaiah 56. It says, And the foreigners, now this is the prophet, hundreds of years earlier, speaking to the, to the Jewish people. He says, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain. That's where the temple is. He says, I want them to come to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So Jesus, he shut down the temple for a day. He drove out the business. He drove out the profiteers. And what he was basically doing was clearing out the place where he had always intended to invite the world. This is where they come. And instead of inviting people to worship the king and know the king and, and worship God and know and receive salvation through the God of Israel, instead of inviting them, you turned it into something completely different. Instead of this place being filled with Gentile seekers, it's filled with robbers. Those who had decided to turn it into something completely different. So on his first arrival, Jesus declares himself as king. He points to this fig tree. Then he goes into the temple. He clears out the temple, and they all hear him say, I'm the king, and here's what my kingdom is about. My kingdom priority is people. It's not all the religious activity. It's not just about you making uh, all of these sacrifices. I'm going to, I'm going to end all of this. It wasn't about the building. He's actually going to come and replace the temple. The temple's going to be transferred from a, from a building of stone to a building of living stones with Christ as the cornerstone. And you and I are part of the body of Christ now. And so he comes and he starts to, to unveil something completely different. I'm not a relief package. I'm a replacement package. I'm coming to replace what you thought would bring you salvation. I'm going to be that salvation for you. I'm going to be a king who's going to do more for you than any earthly king can do. It's going to last longer than anything an earthly king can do. I'm going to give you eternal life. And I'm not just going to cover your bills. I'm not just going to cover your debt. I'm going to cover your sin. I'm coming as the high priest. I'm coming as the king. And I'm coming as the sacrifice. 
that's going to shed his blood. And so he unveils his priority as king. You know, it's easy for us, I think, sometimes to forget the priority of our king. And maybe this is a, a good time out for us. Is he your king? And are you living out his priority? What's his priority? Well, let's go back to the tree. Look at verse 18. And the chief priests and the scribes heard about his teaching. They heard what he did in the money changers' tables and, and clearing out the court of the Gentiles. He heard it. But they wanted, and they wanted to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So it was at that point when they realized he's not just a divine relief package. He, he wants to be the ruler of our lives. He's going to change the way we're living our lives. That They, they said, no, this is not going to work. They started making plans to get rid of this so-called king named Jesus. Verse 19. The next evening comes and they head back out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning coming back to the city... They saw the fig tree withered away all the way to its roots. Did Jesus know what he's doing? Absolutely. He wanted them to make the connection. Peter remembered the, the day before how he had cursed that tree. And he says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And what did that mean? Well, Peter's actually, you know, preaching this through the gospel of Mark. And he makes the connection he wants us to see. The sandwich, the fig tree, the temple, back to the fig tree. It was all coming to an end. That Jesus was not there to renovate the temple. He was there to replace the temple, roots and all. It was a temple that has a different priority, an ultimate priority. And Jesus was there to bring it. And he said, listen, I'm going to start with a new cornerstone to build a new temple made up of people and I'm going to start a new vine, a new tree. And listen to what he says in the book of John. He says, I am the vine. John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers in the branch Branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, if I'm your plant, if I'm your tree, if you're a branch, uh, I am going to expect from you, if you abide in me, here's what's going to happen. You're going to bear fruit. I expected to see fruit on that fig tree. I wanted to see fruitfulness in the temple, and I made the connection for you. You are now my new Israel. You're now my new church, my new temple, and you're not one that necessarily people just come to. You're a temple that goes to the everyday person, joins the everyday person on their journey and introduces them to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you are going to bear fruit. It's about people. And I think the disciples started to put it all together. Oh yeah, you told us early on we're going to be fishers of men. It's not about the fish. It's not about the figs. It's about Everyday people. Is your life, your life about that? Maybe in this time out, we can align our priorities with the priority of our king. You say, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. That sounds like a big change in my life and Seems like it's going to require a lot for me. Well, look exactly. Look where Jesus went in these next few verses, and then I'm going to close. I'll let you, let you dwell on this. In verse 22, he says, that's okay. I gave you my priority. It's people. It's fruitfulness. But I'm, I'm going to show you the power in my kingdom is different. Jesus said, have faith in Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he says what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. He comes and he says, listen, 
The currency of my new kingdom is different from the one you were expecting. The currency of the kingdom that you see down on the ridge over there, the Roman Empire and the currency of the religious elites and authorities of that day uh, is money and power and armies and might. And it was headed by a guy named Herod. Herod the Great was this incredible builder in his day. And people have wondered, what did he mean by taking a mountain and throwing it into the sea? Well, from that top of Mount of Olives, if you look, and it's a clear day, you can see the top of a, of a, of a nearby mountain that looks a little bit like a volcano. And I have a picture of that, hopefully you can see on your screen. This, he turned into a fortress called the Herodian. And literally, he chopped the heads off of one hill there you can see, and there's another one. He, he literally moved part of a couple of mountains to make a brand new mountain to put an impenetrable fortress. And they think that's probably where he was buried. But it took all of the money, all of the power, all the wealth, and tens of thousands of slaves over a period of time. All the power that Herod... Uh, uh, the Jewish king subjugated to the Roman everything that he could do he moved he literally moved a mountain and he's looking Jesus is looking at you and he's looking at me and he says I know I've called you to a Herculean task reach the world for Christ but the currency's faith and prayer you ask and you just you get your shovel and you get your shovel, and you get your shovel, and you get your bucket. You share your testimony. You share your testimony. You serve in your giftedness. You serve in your giftedness. My body, living by faith, my kingdom spread out across the planet, living by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. And just asking God will move the mountain and build an incredible new kingdom. He calls us to a new priority as king, but he gives us a whole new power, and it's faith in God. I know you're going through some difficult times. Trust in God. And in this time out, ask yourself three questions. Here's the first question. Jesus is king. Are you responsive to the king's commands? I heard Corey Tin Moon one time, and you may not have ever heard of her, but she, she kind of compared herself to that cult. She says in that story, I don't even have to be one of the disciples. I'd be happy just to be the cult that Jesus rides on if God calls you if the king of your life commands it and wills it are you responsive is he really your king and maybe this this virus and this craziness and this insanity we're all going through will just reveal and I'm praying it will reveal if we have any false kings in our lives so that we can return to the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. The second question, are you bearing fruit? The kind of fruit that he's looking for, the, the kind of fruit that he's hungry for. He's hungry for us to just talk to and engage everyday people here in Gainesville and around the world just to tell them about Jesus. The fruit of our testimony, of our life, and the fruit of seeing people come to know Christ and worship Him. Are you a branch that's bearing fruit? Are you abiding in Christ? And the third question is this. Do you believe in prayer? Do you trust that if you are praying in accordance with His kingdom values and His kingdom priorities, trust and believe in the mighty hand of God? Is he your king? I'm, we're still in between his two comings. He arrived 2,000 years ago, 
bringing peace, bringing hope, bringing an offer of salvation. Receive him as king. He still, if you'll invite him, he'll march right into your life, into your heart, and give you salvation, and give you hope, and give you power for living. And do that because you know he's going to arrive again. Would you pray with me? Father, I just ask that as we have our hearts bowed and our heads bowed, that all of us would ask those questions. Are you really the king of our lives? We know you're king, but do you rule in our hearts? Are we bearing fruit the way you want us to bear fruit? And don't we believe? And are we exercising the gift of prayer and faith that you've given us? God, may we come out of this time out that you put on our land and on our community. May we come out of it realigned with the Father's purpose, excited about the, what makes Jesus joyful. Help us join everyday people on the journey to life's greatest potential in Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if... God's put something on your heart. If you've made a decision or you'd like us to talk to you about how you can know Christ, how you can join a fellowship, how we can come alongside of you on your journey, please reach out through the website, uh, email us. Uh, however you can, go to westsidebaptist.org backslash prayer and let us know. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'd love to pray for you, and we'll see you next time as we come through Church at Home. And I pray you've had, a, had church together today. God bless you.